righty. Well, that uh, it's seven o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get this uh, show on the road. Thank you all for joining us, whether you're watching on Zoom or on Facebook Live. Um, my name is Sam Jack, and I'm here with Chris Schmucker, who is the curator of the Harvey County Historical Museum. And um, I'm so glad um, that, that Chris um, agreed to team up on this. Um, she's starting her screen share now for her part of the part of the presentation um, about the age of stage in Newton and Wichita. So um, if you have questions or, or comments, um, please type them in the chat or use the Q&A feature on Zoom and we will uh, get to those during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, so without further ado, um, I will turn it over to Chris who, oh, actually one little bit of further ado. I did want to give a quick plug to two virtual programs that Newton Public Library has coming up next week. On, uh, on Monday, the 26th at 7 p.m., um, Newton Public Library is partnering with the Kaufman Museum in North Newton for Sorting Out Race, a community conversation. This ties into the Kaufman's new exhibit about uh, thrift, so thrift store items that you know exhibit racial stereotypes. Um, and we're gonna have uh, several speakers from the community to talk about that, as well as you know, Q and A community conversation portion should be really interesting. And then the following evening, um, Tuesday, October 27th at 7 p.m. That's our monthly fourth Tuesday photography program. And we are going to have Jim Griggs, a great photographer present on uh, night shooting and light painting learn how to do some really cool stuff with your camera and computer software. So now without further ado, I will turn it over to Chris and can't wait to learn from you about the Ragsdale Opera House in Newton. Okay, thank you, Sam. We'll see what we can talk about this evening. Um, well, the Ragsdale Opera House has almost, has always kind of fascinated me, just um, sort of this tragic building in some ways. Um, so we'll, um, we'll explore a little bit about its history. Um, in Newton was a bustling place in the 1880s. Um, buildings were going up, there was land speculation. Um, Newton had kind of shed its rough reputation as a um, bloody, you know, bloody um, and had finally come through that and was now um, on the way to being a, uh, um, um, full-fledged town. So, and this is a picture of Newton in 1885. Um, it's probably one of the earliest pictures we have. It's at the intersection of Six and Main. Um, so there's the buildings we're going up and enter into this um, two brothers, um, the Ragsdale brothers, J.M. and T.P. Ragsdale. Um, when they first came to Newton, they were grocery store guys. And, um, but in about 1879, they decided to branch out and uh, go into real estate. Um, using their own money, they built homes um, or businesses and sold, sold and improved properties. They added over 100 homes and seven business blocks to Newton. In 1884, they turned their attention to their very largest project, building the Opera House at the corner of Broadway and Main. And this is um, Thad or T.P. Ragsdale. Um, we don't have a picture of his brother James. And this is just um, fun line drawings of the houses that they lived in that they built for themselves. Um, they're no longer standing. They would have been in the um, courthouse block, the houses that were torn down for the courthouse. Um, so this is the Ragsdale Opera House. Um, it was quite an impressive structure, actually. Um, it took a year and a half to complete. It was massive three-story structure that covered three lots at 701 Main, or no, at Broadway and Main, 701 Main. Um, the exterior was brick and stone, and the interior was wood. The brothers um, paid 8,000 for the lots, and completed the, the completed structure cost nearly $80,000. And that included the $500 Seth clock that you see clear at the top there. Um, and that clock had a six foot dial and, a, and was 
came with a 600 pound bell um, that some claim could be hear, heard two miles away on a clear day. So the Ragsdale Opera House opened on December 8, 1885. Um, we don't have any actual pictures of the interior except for this line drawing that I have here. Um, the, as far as I know, the first program that was performed was Barney McCauley. He performed what the newspaper called a side-splitting comedy of Uncle Dan. I didn't, didn't take the time to look it up, but that might be interesting to see what that comedy is. Um, the actual entrance to the, um, the, the opera portion of the building was um, on Broadway and was marked with a semi-circular sign that said Ragsdale Opera House. From there, there, you, there was a small lobby and patrons would go up the main stairway, which was constructed of oak and as the paper noted, gracefully curved up to the main theater lobby. The house itself had three levels, which you can kind of get an idea here in this picture, and seated 800 in addition to eight private boxes which could seat five each. The ceiling had ornate frescoes and the walls had wood, the walls and woodwork were painted a dark red. Over the next several years, the interior would be repaired, cleaned and repainted several times. The newspaper comments on this often that the opera house was cleaned completely top to bottom um, as if you read through the Newton Kansans. Um, the last improvement to the, theater, to the theater portion was made in 1911-1912 when it was then again cleaned and the drop curtain was repaired. Some of the early entertainments, um, they usually were in announcements in the, the Newton Kansan or um, Evening Kansan Republican, um, like in this uh, one is the to Uncle Tom's Cabin was performed. Um, and then there was uh, the Linwood drama. Um, they just had different, they would just make announcements to come, come see uh, a play. Here's one of them. The company will pre present a modern Godiva. Um, so there was just a variety of uh, entertainments that you could see. The Opera House was more than just um, uh, operas and plays and traveling companies coming through. It was also a community center. Um, in the late 1880s, 1890s, this idea of a Tom Thumb wedding was very popular. Um, and so this is a picture of a Tom Thumb wedding that was held in the opera house. And the paper, newspaper noted a better pleased audience never filled out the opera house. So what was Tom Thumb weddings? Um, they became popular after 1863 when the marriage of an altar, a very small um, 19th century actor by the name of Charles Stratton, whose sta stage name was General Tom Thumb, married super tiny Levina Warren in New York. Stratton was a national celebrity for his performance with Barnum at, in a sideshow. So that became popular for people to have their children become act out the wedding ceremony. Um, so here in Newton, they, um, the newspaper described the, uh, the ceremony this way. Uh, one of the most enjoyable hometown performance ever presented in Newton. The actions of the little tots who appear for the first time before a large company are always interesting. But last night their performances were peculiarly amusing as they attempted to ape the manners of their elders. The ceremony took place on the stage, quickly performed by the minister, and the groom placed the ring on the bride's finger, during which the bride's mother shed copious tears. Um, churches and organizations would use these productions to raise money and teach young people how to um, etiquette and formal training of just how you behaved in formal situations. Um, and it's, it must have been very cute. <laughs> That was one um, way local people would have used the Opera House other than just watching a show. The Opera House was also the scene of the graduation for the Newton High School for many years. Um, this is the class of 1899. Um, 
I, I did not, I don't know how long it went that they had him. Well, I guess it wouldn't be past 1915, but um, they would have graduations and programs like that at the Opera House. Um, it was more than a post, I said more than a post, an opera house. The um, post office was also located in the, um, on the ground floor of the uh, opera house. And this, at one point it was remodeled. Um, I think this picture is of the remodel. Um, and it says the new office, the new post office in October, 1890 had double the working space and a skylight. We have one of the best post offices in Kansas. Um, it looks rather dreary and crowded to me, but um, <laughs> our, to them, it must have been uh, state of the art. It was also home of the Newton Kansan from 1896 to 1903. And um, the picture on your right is um, a really old picture of you know, sort of the back part of it where the Newton Kansan would have been located. And then the picture on your left shows the sign of the Newton Kansan, excuse me. <laughs> um, Philip H. Knowlton, who was a well-known newspaper um, editor, he recalled that it was in this basement of this historic building that I began my newspaper career after graduating from Newton High School. So it had fond memories for um, various people. Uh, that's where they got their start. It also had a furniture store, um, the Schumacher's furniture. Um, I haven't, I don't know too much about them, but um, it looks like they had quite the selection. It was a Newton landmark. If you look at this picture, you can always date pictures in Newton by um, noting where the, the, the bell tower is for the opera house. Um, if it's not there, you know it's after 1915. Um, we don't really have any pictures, at least at the museum, that go that are before 1885 when this would have been built. So you pretty much can date using that. Um, This is just one of my favorite pictures from um, atop the, the um, you can see the bell power is on top of the opera house. Um, and it's a panoramic of Newton um, in, oh boy, let me just turn the pages a bit up. If I get it right. Um, Well, um, I think around 1900, I have to double check that, sorry. Uh, but you can tell it's, um, it was taken by Stovall, a, a local photographer, and you're looking north, east, and south from the bell tower on top there. Uh, I guess it's a fascinating picture. You can, you know, see, see Main Street going this way and it just is fascinating to me. Um, the Ragsdale brothers lost possession of the Opera House on October on August 11, 1892, as a result of the financial panic of 1890, which was particularly hard on those who had invested in real estate. Um, if you had part of the earlier program that I did on um, EL Paris, this is the same uh, same financial panic that um, did him in as well. Uh, several new owners ha had the building then from then on, and it continued to be known as the Ragsdale until about 1907, when the new owner had the nameplate obliterated and replaced the name with the Knopper, Knopper Opera House. So if you look at some postcards, it will have that name instead. Um, same building, just a different name. Um, at the, about the same time, changes were made to comply with the latest fire regulations. And um, if you read the newspapers throughout this time period, they're always mentioning 
the Opera House and the Newton Hotel, which was another three-story building, as needing to update their fire um, hazard, or you know, make sure they were in compliance with the fire latest fire um, instructions. Uh, the fire was a big concern for these buildings. And then the worst happened um, on New Year's Day, uh, in early in the morning, uh, January 1, 1915, uh, Hal Summers and Mary Russell ran out of gas after they were coming home from a, a party, New Year's Eve party. And it was around 2.30 a.m. And they came to Broadway in Maine and they noticed a light coming from the back of the opera house. Um, and they called the fire department, got help. Um, but it was already too late. Uh, at that point, by the time the fire department got there, they were mainly, I guess you'd call it defensive position, to, uh, keep it from spreading to other buildings. Um, and I guess people were trying to carry out valuables. I'm not sure if that was wise, but they did. Um, the newspaper noted that in a remarkably short time, the rear of the building was ablaze. And this is a picture of, a pretty dramatic picture of the fire. Of course, the newspaper had um, dramatic words to say about it. <laughs> the passing of a landmark. It noted that the last time the old was the third hour of the new year at 15 minutes after three. The hands of the clock dropped from sight. So um, that little bit of drama with the, the opera house, the ending of the opera house is kind of a, a neat touch. Um, basically, in less than an hour, the whole building was gone. Pictures of the destruction. Uh, this is the one on the left is, was taken by an individual, Lucille Mitchell Miller, who documented a lot of Newton history. Uh, she took pictures um, and we, her, her family graciously shared them with us. So we have, um, and she made notes of all the different, um, I mean, she kept very good records too. So we know what they are, uh, but that's her personal picture. And then there's this picture of this car crushed. There was a, uh, a car business that was um, located. It was the Martin Motor Car Company. And actually this happened after the fire several days later, one of the brick walls fell down onto the cars and um, they were Buicks, two of which had never been driven before, so they were brand new. So it was kind of a blow in that regard. There was one fatality, um, Willis T. Green, and uh, it's a sad story. They did find him and it looked like he had tried to escape but could not make it out. Uh, so it's, uh, that was, it, of the two huge fires in Newton, the one that happened um, in, in August of 1914, which was six months, basically six months earlier. And this one, there, there was only this one fatality. So that actually is pretty amazing if you think about it. The other sad part, sad or hard story is the McManus department store. He lost out twice. These pictures are actually from the 1914 fire, the August 4th one. And at that time, he moved to the Opera House. He moved his business to the Opera House. So in January 1 of 1915, he lost his business again. Uh, so I can't imagine <laughs> how he must have felt. That must have been incredibly discouraging. Um, so by daylight, um, the landmark was gone. Uh, had been there since 1885. Uh, and you can see people here looking at the destruction. And today we have a marker to mark the location there at Broadway in Maine that you can go read about uh, as more information. So um, with that, I will turn it over to, to Sam for his part. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. That's really interesting. And um, yeah, my, my part of this, presentation, it focuses on Wichita. 
I wrote an article about this topic for the East Wichita News and West Side Story newspapers. And I kind of expanded it a bit for this presentation and found some more photos. And um, I think that a lot, of, a lot of this stuff, even though it's about Wichita, it also applies to, to Newton. You know, I, I did see that the Ragsdale Opera House was thousands of references to it in the, in the newspaper archives. You can find about all the different shows. And I'm sure that many of these performers that I'm gonna talk about were also performing in Newton around the same time. So um, with that, let me get my PowerPoint going here. And, all right, great, there we go. And let me, oh, my, let me get my picture going too. Because I think it's still showing Chris's picture. Oh, do I need to close out? No, you don't. Let me, you don't need to do anything. Let okay. me just, um, okay. Cancel the spot. There we go. Now it'll show my picture while I'm talking. So, all right, now I'll share screen. Okay, great. So you should be seeing my, my picture now. All righty. So here we start with this, um, this drawing, you know, kind of an artist's impression of, of the intersection of Douglas and Maine in the early 1870s, or I guess 1873, specifically Wichita. Um, and yeah, this is an illustration of Kino Corner, which Patricia Ann Mather, um, she wrote a master's thesis about theatrical Wichita, and it was a great resource for me. I, I drew a lot of information from that. And she referred to Kino Corner, I think, uh, quoting some other folks, as the most riotous spot between the two seas. And this was Wichita's frontier Cowtown era, which um, I know Chris uh, knows quite a bit about as well. Um, when the citizenry was cow punchers, gamblers, prostitutes, vagrants, and renegades, as well as some respectable folk, I assume. Um, and as the caption in this old clipping says, Kino Corner got its name from a gambling parlor that was on the upper floor of one of the buildings. Wichita's first theater opened somewhere in the vicinity of Kino Corner, according to Mather. She doesn't, um, doesn't say exactly where. I don't know if that information exists or not. But um, a Wichita Eagle reporter in 1941 wrote that, quote, it is not recorded that women of the young community considered it at all genteel to attend this first theater of the city. So I wasn't able to find, like I said, I wasn't able to find any images of that theater itself. Um, but I did find a really interesting column in a 1922 issue of the Wichita Beacon, where the writer Dave Leahy, he said that he went and talked to some old timers who were around for this era of Wichita. And they recalled and recounted to him that the manager and the star performer of that first theater was a man named Johnny Redding. Um, this is not a photo of Redding. Um, and I'll tell you why in a second here. Uh, well, because we don't have a photo is the reason, but I'll tell you why these photos are up. Redding was a female impersonator, or in today's terms, a drag performer. Um, this is a different female impersonator from a few decades, a few decades later, one that became pretty famous for his female impersonation, uh, Julian Eltinge. So this that can, kind of gives you an idea of what female impersonation was at that time. And it was actually a pretty popular thing. Um, this is what Dave Leahy wrote about Johnny Redding, kind of relaying the stories from these old timers. And it's kind of a long quote, but I'm going to read it all because it's, uh, I think it, it paints a really vivid picture of uh, Mr. Redding. Uh, quote, he had a voice like a nightingale or thrush. Not only was he a great singer for his time, but he was a comedian of rare parts a tragedian who could lift the roof off the stoutest barn with his vocal explosions, wizard at sleight of hand, a clog dancer of memorable, a clog dancer of memorable merit, a banjo picker of wonderful technique, a juggler and acrobat, and one who could forecast fortunes and reveal the undeveloped capacities of men in accordance with approved phrenological science. So that is a lot for one person to, to be good at. Um, but it really seems like 
the, the kind of, a, you know, the kind of classic vaudeville style performer of this kind of old west frontier era had to be a jack of all trades like that because you didn't have many touring performers at all coming through. So if you want customers to come back, you know, one night you play the banjo, the next night you dress up as a woman. A few days later, it might be clog dancing and fortune telling or what have you. Um, I, I've got a couple photos here of what these early theaters in Wichita could have looked like. This is the theater area in the Gem Saloon in Deadwood, Dakota Territory around 1877. Um, if you've seen the show Deadwood on HBO, you know, this is a photo of the actual saloon that the, that the gem saloon on the show is based upon. Um, as you can see, it's pretty bare bones, just a room with a table and some chairs and a makeshift stage. If anything, I'd say Reading's Theater was likely even smaller and more rudimentary than this. The same, uh, the same goes for another theater from Wichita's earliest days. According to Mather, there was a theater called Llewellyn's Hall which was just a room above a grocery store near the intersection of Main and Elm. And all we know about that in terms of performers is that Uncle Jack Payton would often um, kind of give us his theological ramblings. So maybe not the greatest entertainment value, but who, who can say? There was a third early theater on the 100 block of Douglas Avenue that I, um, I didn't find much about, but it was, I guess, a cut above these other two. It had opera style seats and it had a curtain that opened and closed vertically up and down instead of side to side on pulleys, which was you know, cheaper. And then this is just another photo. I think this might be closer to actually what Johnny Redding's theater would have looked like. This is the old opera house in Red Cloud, Nebraska. Actually, that Red Cloud happens to be Willa Cather's hometown and she would have attended this theater as a little girl. Um, and just, you know, you can see it's, it's a pretty, um, it's a, it's a pretty bare bones setup. You know, it's just the kind of thing that the homemade look to it. But then there's Eagle Hall, which was another, another step up from, from those theaters I've talked about so far. Um, Eagle Hall was built on the Eagle Block, which I think was right across from Kino Corner that, I don't know if that sounds right to you, Chris, um, on the corner of Douglas and Main. And the, um, it was reportedly, quote, considered a fitting, or was the first Wichita theater considered a fitting and proper place for the ladies. So, a, you know, fa a family friendly venue. Uh, the photo up on the screen here is from 1876 and it's from the Kansas Historical Society's collection. And this is showing performers at Eagle Hall in The Doctor of Alcantara, which was the first uh, musical show that was actually mounted and performed by local talent rather than a touring troupe. Uh, so, you know, the Wichita Community Theater, Music Theater of Wichita, all of the homegrown theater that we enjoy in Wichita, it kind of starts here with this show in 1872. Um, and actually the Doctor, Doctor of Alcantara, it's also, um, thought of as the, the first American musical um, because it, I think it was, um, it, you know, it gained popularity in America rather than in Europe. Um, the plot is pretty similar to The Barber of Seville or any number of other operettas. Basically, a young man's in, in love with a young woman, but his, uh, but his parents don't like it. And the, the woman, the young woman's parents don't like it either and they try to get together and their parents try to stop them. But then in the end, it turns out that it was all a big misunderstanding. Their parents had already agreed that they could be married and they just, it was just a case of mistaken identity and everybody lived happily ever after. Um, so according to Mather, the audiences at Eagle Hall could become quite vocal if they were displeased by the performance they had paid their five cents or 10 cents to see. Uh, one anecdote has it that um, one time a scheduled performer failed to appear and then a theater employee or possibly the owner, rather than just refund everybody's tickets, uh, decided that he would put on his own show instead and keep all the money. So he tried, you know, he tried to pull something off, um, but then uh, there was lots of grumbling 
and a contingent of the audience left and got rotten eggs and tomatoes and came back and threw them at him. And then he had to flee and basically seek refuge with law enforcement to avoid being tarred and feathered. Um, these are early members of the Lotus Club in Wichita, which was founded either in 1875 or 1878. Uh, I found some conflicting dates, but the Lotus Club, upon their founding, they built Russell Hall, which included a ballroom and a theater. The theater was used mostly by the members who performed lectures and musical entertainments for one another. Um, a vastly more ambitious cl social club based project was from the Turn, I think it's pronounced Turnverein, the Turnverein Society, which was a social club for German Americans. They built this large hall in 1879 with seating for 1,000. Um, and it was called the Turner Opera House. I guess Turnverein was difficult for people to pronounce back then too. And it was a regular venue in Wichita up until 1906. It was the first, I guess, upon its completion, it replaced Eagle Hall as the leading venue in the city, had a huge stage complete with trap doors, theater lighting, and five different sets of scenery. Um, and I think this is, you know, an interesting thing that you realize if you do a lot of, of reading in old newspapers is that, you know, th this period, there was a total mania for social clubs. Um, I, you know, clubs based on ethnicity, religious affiliation, any number of different interests. You know, you could you could find a little small town like Conway Springs, and they would have five different competing literary societies, for example. So um, that's a, just a interesting thing. You know, another another uh, venue that's linked to a social club that you can still visit today is the Scottish Rite Theater, which is still standing and was erected in 1907. Um, let's see. Yeah, so um, at some point between 1884 and 1886, Turner Hall was remodeled and renovated by L.M. Crawford. And at that point, it was renamed the Crawford Opera House. Um, I had a little bit of trouble pin pinning down the date when this occurred because a lot of the newspaper clippings simply referred to the Opera House because this was the only building worthy of that name. So it's, it's a bit confusing. Perhaps someone listening out there knows more and can fill me in on exactly when this became the original Crawford Opera House. And um, I'm gonna talk a bit, move over to talk a bit about, a bit more about some performers. This is Charlotte Thompson, who performed a double bill of Jane Eyre and Camille at the Opera House the building on the previous slide in 1884. Thompson was London born and she was probably the first really famous performer to make it to Wichita. She was also a serious uh, legit, legitimate actress, which was something new for probably a lot of the audience who saw her because most of the stuff that you could see in Wichita up to that time would have been you know, light operetta, vaudeville shows and minstrel shows. Uh, Thompson toured the U.S. almost constantly between 1874 and 1885, with a particular emphasis on gold rush towns and American, you know, in the American West, where there there was a lot of new money and people with money to burn, and I'm sure she did quite well for herself financially. Uh, she must have done well in Wichita in particular, because she returned a number of times after her initial performance. And perhaps the word spread that Wichita was a viable market for touring performers, because over the next few years, an increasing number of performers with national profiles like, like Charlotte Thompson added Wichita to their circuits. Uh, one of those new performers was another English woman, Adelaide Moore. In 1886, Moore made a splash by arriving in Wichita in a custom built railroad car. According to the paper, it was lined with embossed leather, amaranth wood and satin wood inlaid with mother of pearl and ebony. Uh, the car reportedly cost $56,000, which I put it in an inflation calculator 
And that's about $1.5 million in today's money. So, you know, that was probably inflated because it's all PR, but still pretty luxurious. And the public was actually invited to, you know, go to the, go to the railroad station and walk through her custom railroad car and just gawk at how wealthy this famous actress was. Um, Moore may have had a speech impediment, and it seemed like whenever she went to major cities on the coasts, like London New and New York, she would get poor reviews that would appear in the papers, which may be why she went to so many, you know, more rugged locations. Um, in Seattle, the audience members, as reported in the paper, said she was not good, <laughs> which I, I just thought was funny. Um, but, you know, whatever her skills were as an actress, she was beautiful and she was rich, or at least she was presented as rich by her publicists. And then as now that's its own attraction, celebrity. Um, yeah, and according to the, according to the Midwest Documentary Center, she mysteriously disappeared in 1891, but I couldn't find any sources to back that up. So I'm not sure whether it's true or not. Um, Okay, and this brings us to the, uh, the Crawford Grand Opera House, which uh, Ellen Crawford, again, announced the construction of the new opera house in 1887. Um, at times it was called either the Crawford Opera House or the Crawford Grand Opera House in the papers, which was also a little bit confusing. You know, papers weren't that consistent about how different buildings were labeled at this time, it seems like. Um, but it, it, this building that you can see in the picture there was on the southwest corner of William and Topeka. Um, according to the Eagle, the Crawford Opera, the Grand Opera House here was designed with a proscenium stage, uh, 38 feet wide by 28 feet high, uh, four private boxes, orchestra level seating for 500, 450 more could sit on the first balcony, and then 600 on top of that in the cheap seats on the second on the second level balcony. And the Eagle proudly noted that the size of this house and stage will be larger than two thirds of the theaters in Chicago. Uh, Chicago was a frequent point of comparison. This is another thing I noticed reading through all of these papers. Chicago was a, has been a frequent point of comparison for reporters of this era, you know, that were trying to like boost Wichita, say, say how the commerce, the commerce industry compares the agriculture, the sports, whatever it is, there's, there's bound to be some kind of note about how it compares to Chicago, usually pretty favorably. Um, so yeah, the, the Crawford Grand, it opened in February of 1888, about a year after it was announced, I guess, with a performance of an operetta, the Gypsy Baron. And it remained Wichita's most prestigious theater and the home of legitimate entertainment until it burned down, like the Ragsdale Opera House, it burned down on April 1st, uh, 1913. So I guess that was just, uh, you know, probably when the Ragsdale burned down, I bet people thought back to the burning of the Crawford Grand Opera House because it had just happened a couple of years earlier. Um, but, you know, the back in 1888, I it seems like the opening of this Crawford Grand Opera House kicked things into a higher gear in terms of the frequency and the prominence of famous names and famous people and troops coming to perform in Wichita. And I'm not, the, I'm not sure if that's because of the construction of the house itself. You know, it was, it was the foremost house in Wichita. Um, so maybe that the availability of that venue was what attracted people or maybe Wichita's time had just come or maybe it was some of both, but either, either way. Um, so I guess, let me see here. Um, yeah, in the following slides, I'm going to um, highlight some of the performers that came to either the Old Crawford or to the Crawford Grand in 1888, the season of the, the opening season of the Crawford Grand. You know, if you look at the, 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 the master's thesis that I mentioned, I could have chosen 1889 or 1887 and had a lot of great stuff too, but I thought it was interesting just to focus on one year because it seems like this was a big year for Wichita in theater in terms of, of getting more of these uh, great acts and performers to come in. 
So here's the here's the first one. Um, Robert Downing performed Spartacus the Gladiator at the Crawford Grand in 1888. Down at the bottom of the poster on the left, you can see it was billed as the elite tragic event. Um, this particular copy of the poster is not from Wichita, but I think it would have likely, the same poster would likely have been put up locally to advertise Robert Downing as Spartacus. Um, and then on the right, you can see that he also performed uh, Samson, you know, kind of specializing in heroic sword and sandals types, I guess. Um, and I, you know, sword and sandals, is, I guess is what I'm calling it. I'm not sure they called it that back then, but that was the popular genre for stage audiences in Kansas and across the country in the 19th century. And of course, well, you know, right into the 20th century in the present day. Uh, Spartacus and Ben-Hur were both wildly popular on stage and were frequently seen in Wichita in one form or another. Actually in 1914, the, new, the newly built Wichita Forum welcomed a touring production of Ben-Hur in this ama amazingly elaborate production of Ben-Hur based on how it was described. You know, Ben-Hur has that, the, the main attraction of Ben-Hur is the chariot race. And so for the chariot race scene, they had a huge treadmill with 12 horses galloping on it and um, a moving background that they scrolled behind the horses, you know, to simulate the chariot race. It sounds really amazing. Um, and of course, both Spartacus and Ben-Hur became, you know, decades later, hit Hollywood, mega hit Hollywood movies, Ben-Hur in 1959, and then Spartacus a year later in 1960. I just think that's kind of interesting to see, you know, um, people's tastes didn't change that much between 1888 and 1960, I guess, in terms of liking these stories. Okay, again, staying in 1888, this is Lillian Olcott. And it, and I think that what she did would be, appeal to a very different audience well, with some overlap, but a different audience than would have been going to the Spartacus entertainment. Uh, Ms. Olcott starred in Theodora, which is a, a Christian drama. Um, there's an aria, I mean, there's an oratorio called Theodora by Handel it's basically, you know, Theodore is a Christian martyr. And so you can see in this photo, she's where she's very prominently wearing a cross. And uh, she, I think she would have marketed, you know, marketed her, her personality as someone who was a devout Christian, someone who was giving kind of a, a more pious entertainment, maybe something that, that Christ, conservative Christians who wouldn't dream of going to the popular theater Maybe they would make an exception to go to Theodora because it was such a, a such a, a religious topic. Um, uh, Ms. Olcott died in April of 1888, just a few weeks after she performed in Wichita. I think coincidentally, um, the Union Town the paper in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, reported that she performed wearing diamonds that were valued at seventy-five thousand dollars, which. I think would be like $2 million in today's money. And you can see again, look at, look at how much jewelry she's wearing. And the cross has got some kind of gemstones on it and then strings of pearls and, and earrings. You know, you can basically, she's pretty, she's wearing a lot of bling there, but was it really $75,000 worth? Hmm, I think that might be PR or publicity. You know, whether the diamonds were real or pretend, we just have to, to, have our own answer to that, I guess. Um, these are a couple of comedians who performed in Wichita in 1888. On the left is Frankie Kremble, who performed in Sybil. And um, that image there is actually um, an actor, you know, a trading cards basically that were included as a promotion in packs of cigarettes. And then another comedian, who came to Wichita in 1888 is on the right here, smoking a cigar, Lotta Crabtree. Um, she was so famous that she was referred to in the press oftentimes simply as Lotta, you know, sort of like Oprah or Beyonce today, right? Um, Lotta actually quit the stage around a year after her Wichita appearance 
I think that she had some health problems. Um, but by the time she, she quit her touring career, she had become a multimillionaire, the richest actress in American history up to that point. And she retired pretty well. I think she went to, she lived with her mother for a number of years because I think she was only like 45 when she retired. And she had an 18 room mansion in New Jersey where she spent the summers. And then she had purchased an entire hotel in Boston where she lived the rest of the year in great luxury. Another act from 1888, the Hanlon brothers. Um, and this kind of surprised me. I didn't know anything about this when I, when I found this on the list of, of uh, 1888 performers. These gentlemen were basically kind of, they were circus slash theatrical artists. Um, they were trapeze artists, probably the, the best trapeze artists of at least of American extraction at this time. And their signature, they performed in theaters, not in circus tents. And their signature trick was to have three trapezes that they would swing across the, across the auditoriums where they performed over the audience's head, um, which was, was thrilling and kind of probably scary for the audience as well. And it was, you know, it was pretty risky. And the eldest Hanlon brother, Thomas, he fell and suffered a head injury. And I think that's why he's not on this poster um, because the, the head injury stopped him from continuing his performing career. So the remaining Handlin brothers were actually the inventors of the aerial safety net. Um, and the show that the Handlins did in Wichita was called Phantasma. And according to the brothers biographer, Mark Cosden, the show in incorporated pantomime, acrobatic tricks and stage, man uh, stage magic, all within kind of a fairy tale plot. So, you know, it really sounds quite a bit like Cirque du Soleil to me, which I think is kind of, I, I'm not sure if there's a connection there or a lineage there, but I think it's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, they, the brothers reworked their show every year until 1912, and that was actually captured on film by Thomas Edison in 1914. Okay, uh, Eunice Goodrich. This is kind of a different, you know, I tried to pick ones that are kind of different categories or different types of performers. Um, Eunice, it was Eunice Goodrich and, and her Mary Company. And it seemed like kind of a, a classic vaudeville troupe, basically variety performance. You know, Eunice, you can see her on the left. She toured with a, a child performer who went by the stage name Theodora, um, called in advertising the pet of the people, the child wonder, and Pottle's baby. Pottle being Goodrich and Theodora's manager. Uh, from the photo, I don't know how old she is, maybe, you know, maybe no older than 10 in this photo anyway. So sounds like quite a prodigy. Um, Eunice Goodrich would, would uh, you know, do comic monologues and sing, and she would do a, serpent, a serpentine dance with silk scarves. And actually Theodora would also do a serpentine dance. And according to the Peoria Journal, uh, she quote, made her appearance as an old time minstrel, bringing on her little chair and banjo and entertaining the audience with plantation melodies. So I'm not sure whether when Theodora did this minstrel act, whether she would have put on blackface makeup for her minstrel segment. Uh, but however, many others certainly did. This is a photo of a blackface performer who starred in a production of Uncle Tom's Cabin that toured to both Topeka and Wichita in 1910. Minstrel performances of Uncle Tom's Cabin were a staple in late 1800s Wichita and in Newton. You saw at the Ragsdale Opera House was one that Chris mentioned, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, in Wichita, the, this melodrama was presented almost every year and without any gaps from 1891 through 1910. These, uh, these Tom shows, as they came to be called, usually retained the anti-slavery message of Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. But at the same time, they were minstrel shows with, um, and they caricatured and mocked black characters. 
Uncle Tom and other leads were always played by white performers in blackface with black pe people allowed on the stage, if at all, only as extras or background. So um, coverage of these Tom shows in the Wichita papers tended to dwell on spectacle with each year's production trying to be make itself more elaborate and extravagant than the year previous. An 1897 performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin repeatedly or reportedly featured um, a pack of Siberian bloodhounds, 20 ponies and burros, nine different backdrops, and a large chorus of black plantation jubilee singers who supplemented the uh, white performers wearing blackface. Um, and this, um, this poster is from a different Uncle Tom's Cabin Company, one that didn't come to Wichita, but it kind of shows you what, what these parades, which you know happen every year in Wichita for quite some time, would have looked like. You know, you can see here the Siberian bloodhounds and the you know the ponies and burros that are part of the show as well as part of the parade. It looks like in this first carriage, it looks like white men who will probably the ones that would would don blackface to perform the leads. Um, there's, you know, it's not clear whether this woman is a black person or a, a white person wearing blackface. And then even in the background, you can see they've got a, like a parade float with the Uncle Tom's Cabin set piece that would be used in the show. Um, yeah, yeah. And like I said, the, the parades like this happened in Wichita every, every year for quite some time. Okay. So Uncle Tom's Cabin, it was the most popular novel in the world during the 19th century. But even with that huge popularity, it's likely that more people were exposed to Uncle Tom's Cabin through these Tom shows than would have ever read the original book. Um, and both the Tom shows and the, and the book popularized these false stereotypes about black people that they were you know, lazy, carefree, that they were naturally subservient, that they were unintelligent. Um, and the shows were, you know, were often worse than the book itself in their depiction of, of black people because they would change the ending. In the novel, Tom is, you know, um, Tom is, as he's dying, forgives the people responsible for his death, kind of a Christ-like sacrifice. But in these Tom shows that was often replaced with a happy ending where Tom you know, convinces his oppressors to be nicer to him. And then they basically continue on happily as slave and master, which was really subverting Harriet Beecher Stowe's message. Um, but the popularity of, of blackface minstrelsy, you know, it shouldn't lead us to overlook the fact that there were black, black performers present and active in Wichita and in Kansas during this period. So um, pictured here is a troupe from this period that toured under the name, the original Georgia Minstrels. This particular troupe wasn't in Wichita as far as I've seen, but it was interestingly, this was one of the few that was actually owned and managed by a black man, the man seen here at the center, Charles Hicks. Um, and Hicks had some, Hicks eventually, you know, he, he had to move to Europe and try to make a living over there because of the racism he faced as, as a black owner of one of these troops. Um, and actually, even the black, though they're not wearing the black face makeup in this photo montage, usually even the black men were expected to wear the exaggerated black face makeup during uh, the minstrel show performances. So, you know, what, you might be curious what if you go to one of these minstrel shows, what would you see? Well, I'll kind of try to paint a, a picture a little bit. Um, as the curtain would go up on one of these performances, you would see a group of about this size, you know, 14 or 15 men uh, seated in a semicircle shaking tambourines. And then at the front, um, well, there'd be three stock characters, the interlocutor and then two comedic foils who are often called Mr. Bones and Mr. Tambo. And Mr. Bones and Mr. Tambo would kind of uh, banter and engage in word, word play with the interlocutor who was more of a straight man and who often wore whiteface. And um, 
yeah, and then the, the, the structure of the shows was traditionally kind of in three acts. The first would be the walk round with the cast all on stage kind of bantering in the semicircle. The second part would be an oleo with dances, songs, comic speeches, and then finally an after piece, which would be a longer sketch. And then to top everything off would often be a cakewalk dance and song. Um, th this format and the, yeah, this format and, and the, you know, the genre of the minstrel show, it got started in the 1840s prior to the Civil War, um, performed at that time exclusively by white Northerners in blackface. But then after the war, increasingly real black people, you know, became involved. Um, I found an analysis by Patrick O'Connor where he found that at the Emporia Opera House between 1881 and 1913, there were 52 different uh, appearances of minstrel acts at the Emporia Opera House, which shows you how popular this was. And of those 52, at least 23 were black companies, you know, black performers in the companies. So, you know, the black people's presence in minstrelsy, I think it's kind of an uncomfortable historical fact because by participating, these black people were, were helping to spread kind of a racist and demeaning vision of African-Americans and one that you can still see echoes of today. On the other hand, you know, because of that same racism, this was the only opportunity for many black performers to make a living using their musical or theatrical talents. You know, it was either this or nothing. Um, the, the gentleman depicted on this slide, he, his name is Ernest Hogan, and he actually did perform in Wichita in 1888, as well as in 1887 and 1886, he came back repeatedly with a troupe called Halliday's Colored Minstrels. Um, commercially, Hogan was very successful. He was the first black entertainer to produce and star in a Broadway show, 1907's The Oyster Man. And he was also a composer of ragtime music and one of the first to publish sheet music of a ragtime song. However, he incorporated racist language into his lyrics, including the N word and the C word. And this uh, self directed abuse, you know, it probably, I, I can speculate that it, it, it may have actually made him more palatable to racist white audiences, less, less threatening, maybe. Um, and then Hogan later said that he regretted his, his role in creating this musical subgenre that was so demeaning and stereotypical toward black people. Um, but he did, he also argued that his popular tunes in his career opened the doors for later black artists. And here, here are a few of those later black artists that he might have pointed to. Um, you, on the left, you have Ma Rainey and on the right, Noble Sissel and Yubi Blake. And these, um, you know, three, three great performers that, that it's definitely um, something in, interesting to learn more about. Uh, all three of these performers, they did perform in the context of minstrel shows, um, but they refused to wear the offensive blackface makeup. And they were hoping to, from within this institution of the minstrel show, they were hoping to, to change minds and, and facilitate a transition to a more respectful treatment of African-American performers at the, um, but however, um, according to a Library of Congress researcher, Stephanie Hall, they instead became an exception to the rule. So kind of a, you know, this, this Ernest Hogan and, and this kind of a, you know, thorny historical questions and, and, and ambiguities around, around the whole phenomenon of the minstrel show. Um, well, I'm, for this, I, I'm gonna kind of jump back to the, to the white side of the, you know, of the pretty heavily segregated theater scene of this time to talk about Sarah Bernhardt. And Sarah Bernhardt, she was arguably the first truly global celebrity, at least in the realm of acting, so her, she was like a megastar, you know. So her Wichita appearance 
on April 6, 1906 at the Toller Auditorium in Wichita. That was a really big deal. Um, the image on the left captures Bernhardt at age 37 in 1880. And then on the right um, is 1906, the year she was in Wichita when she was 62. Um, you know, she, I can't really see any wrinkles on her 62 year old face. So there may have been some brushing out of wrinkles, I don't know, but she was famous for her beauty, so who knows. Um, and so the, the doors, according to newspaper accounts, the doors of the Toller opened at 7.30 p.m. on the day of the performance. You know, they, the, the crowd was almost pushing them down. Uh, a press of 2,000 people sold out house waiting to take their seats in standing places. And then on the roads around the theater, there were even more Wichitans who weren't able to swing tickets. They were just standing, hoping that they could get a glimpse of Sarah Bernhardt as her carriage rode up to the theater or drove away. And um, of the, sh the, the show was Camille, which was a very popular play. And Bernhardt afterward told a local reporter that the Wichitans, you know, they came to see Bernhardt, the celebrity, but they ended up appreciating her art and her acting. And so that, that, was, a, that was a nice thing. Um, and you know, Mather, who I've referenced a few times, the, the researcher, um, she, wrote, she wrote, were the theatrical history of Wichita a play divided into three acts, Bernhardt's performance near the end of the second act would be a fitting climax. The appearance of any actress after that time could only have been part of the denouement. So speaking of denouement of this age of stage, I kind of thought it would be fitting to, to cut things off here with the dawn of cinema. This is an ad for Edison's Vitascope, which was exhibited at the Crawford Grand in January, 1897. And then the first true silent film was in 1904, The Lost Child. And that's a silent film that you can watch on the Library of Congress's website. So, you know, forever after 1904, at least, stage productions would be sharing the spotlight with the movies. And that really changed, that really changed things. Uh, Mather noted that between 1911 and 1920, the list of stage stars that came to Wichita was not nearly as long as the list for the decade previous. Instead, you had movie stars like John Barrymore, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks on the marquees. And that, you know, it didn't spell the end of, of Wichita theater by any means. I mean, I know the, that, uh, of course, like Kristen, Kristen Chenoweth has, was part of the Music Theater Wichita Company, you know, for example. Um, Desi Oakley is on Broadway right now. Well, not right now, but, you know, with performers from Wichita have continued to make it, make it big in theater and then big theatrical performers continued to come. But it was never the same, you know, after the dawn of cinema um, in Wichita or anywhere in the country. So that uh, concludes my, my slideshow presentation. I'm gonna thank you all for listening. And I am going to, um, let me see here. Um, now is a, a time for the, the Q and A portion. If you all have any questions, um, please type them in the Q and A field or in the chat if you're in Zoom, or if you're on Facebook, type them in the Facebook chat and I will see them. And we do have one already queued up from Catherine. Uh, Chris, maybe you can answer this. She asked, what caused the fire at the Ragsdale Opera House? Oh, yeah, I forgot to say, they never could determine what started it. Um, that's one of the mysteries. <laughs> so they don't know. No, no conclusive evidence was found as to what started it. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, it's really, in, and I, I didn't mention that um, the, after the Crawford burned, it was, it was replaced by the new Crawford, which um, was a theater and then became a movie house. Um, that's kind of later on in the story, you know. Well, and uh, I'll give a, give a few more, give a little bit more time if anybody uh, wants to type some questions. Um, 
me see. I guess I had I had one that I thought of about your presentation, Chris. Um, what was it? Ready? Do you have any questions about mine, Chris? I mean, we don't have to have questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, was the, la was the Ragsdale rebuilt, Libby asks. Um, I think the answer is no, but yeah. No, I could also tell you that was the second opera house. There was actually a first, an opera house, that building that where Mike's rent to own is now, that would have been the first opera house in Newton. Um, hmm. So. And I guess the main, I mean, I know there's a theater at Bethel College. Would that, are there other theaters currently in, in Newton that we can think of? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. The, the auditorium would have had a theater, I think, but that's gone too. Yeah. Yeah. No. Hmm. Yeah, I think they, the, they were talking about, I think the Greg's anyway had gas lamps, I think. I saw that question. Oh yeah, that was a question. Yeah, were there oil lamps used? Um, and I think that there would have been. Um, I didn't really see it mentioned. Um, and then Jane Jones noted that there was also a Turner Hall in Newton, mm -hmm. um, another similar German American social organization built that hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I know that I know that there's um Ron said there's a stage and auditorium at the Masonic Hall. I guess that would be in Newton, right? So Yes. And I know that there are a number of, of theaters in Wichita that I didn't mention. It was just kind of um, a matter of time, you know. Um, when was the Fox built? Is that, let me see. Do you know about that one? Um, I'm not sure when the Fox built. Is that the 500 block? I think it would probably be after um, 1914. Isn't that in the 500 block? Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. Um, I haven't researched that building, so I don't know. Maybe unless Jane or Ron know if they're around. I don't know who's all here. Yeah, Ron is here. I have not researched that building. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, what was the but, uh, sure, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Carolyn asked, what was the population of Newton at that time? That I don't know. <laughs> yeah, lower than it is now, I guess. Um, well, does Ron know? <laughs> Newton, Kansas, 1910 population. Let's see. Google says. Good old Google says that in 1910, the population was 7,800. So that, I don't know if that's correct or not, but it sounds about right, I guess. Um, oh, I was gonna say, um, you know, looking at that interior of, of, the, of the Ragsdale Opera House, if you want to go to a, if you wanna to go to a theater that is pretty similar, I would, I would say the McPherson Opera House really reminds me of that interior. Um, and it's also a, a similar thing on a second floor with, with other stuff on the ground floor. And that's been restored, really great place. I actually got to perform in an opera there with Wichita Grand Opera a few years ago, which is pretty fun. It's got a raked floor, which took some getting used to. I'm, I think probably a lot of these theaters had raked floors. So you're always walking up and down a slant when you're trying to perform and it's easy to fall over. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, let me I see. Will add that, oh, I was gonna say Burton also had an opera house and it burned as well. Ooh. So, so it's was, it was a popular thing to have opera houses. Yeah, opera houses, that's a whole other presentation. There are opera houses and, you know, called things called opera houses all over the country from this era. And I think, I think quite, a, quite a few of them have survived. Oh, a Kay Pearson asked, did the brothers remain in Newton after they lost their money and property? No, um, they both went different places. Um, uh, Thaddeus actually died in 
uh, he, 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 that's sort of a sad story. He died um, in 1892. Yeah, in 1892. Um, and he had mental health problems. Um, his, he never, he never seemed to recover from that crash of losing all his, his wealth. Um, but he was in Burlingame when he died. Uh, but I think he's buried here in Newton. Yeah, the other brother lived to 1930. And I'm not sure where he went to. Uh, they went different places from there, um, trying to make money. Uh, I have not researched the other brother as much. Mm -hmm. And um, Ron, Ron made note that the museum has a detailed listing of the performers and productions at the Ragsdale. Um, so that would be pretty interesting to look at. And um, yeah, if you, Carrie Ann Mather, if you do a Google search for that, you can find the, the thesis that I referred to a few times, which has a lot of lists of performers and theaters, a lot more detail on the Wichita side of things. Um, okay, cool. Well, thank you all for coming and, and, uh, and listening. I, I hope you, en hope you enjoyed it. And Chris, thank you as well. This was great to do it with you. And yeah, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, I will, uh, sign us off now. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.